And I'm Steve Spearman, and welcome back uh, to our live stream here. We uh, will be talking this week about what we sent out a video uh, earlier on Tuesday about cross-functional or multidisciplinary teams. Yeah, and then there's a few important things about Scrum teams. Um, first off, a Scrum team is cross-functional, meaning it has all the skills on the team that are required to get to an increment of value. Uh, this kind of connects to one of my favorite topics to talk about, which is how you slice work into increments of value, but I'm gonna try and stay away from that as long as possible here, because every conversation seems to go that Throw way. Scrum teams are also self-organizing, uh, meaning they decide how they're going to meet that goal. Yeah. So they're, they're managed according to delivering value, not how they do the work, which means there, sh there shouldn't be somebody getting in there and assigning details of work to team members. And, and we've got stories of how that has happened. That's not how it's supposed to work. Yeah, and we try to track it in our uh, perk charts and assign people to things, and yeah, not so much anymore. And, and, and the idea really is that teams are smart, right? I mean, one of the things I think about about this idea is that one of the problems with how we did this traditional work was we, we assumed there was somebody smart up the pyramid who tells the people down here what to do. And we still give them the what, if you will, but the how is left almost entirely to the team. And it turns out there is more brains there, there's more insights there. And so we're trying to take advantage of that. Well, and with the nature of complex work, is such that the people close to the work are inevitably going to know more mm -hmm. about what's going on and what needs to be done and how one person's work relates to another. And there's no one person who could get their head around all of that. Yeah, not to mention that translation problem that typically happened, right, where we uh, somebody told somebody who told somebody else who wrote it down. And, and it's kind of like the telephone tag game where by the time the team got it, it was pretty much unrecognizable. And they didn't really even know what they were supposed to be doing. And mm -hmm. so all of that is supposed to go away here. Yeah. So our, our video emphasized, um, the video that went out on Tuesday um, uh, in our Scrum Fundamentals series, it emphasized cross-functional and self-organizing. The, the thing it didn't mention that I like to emphasize when I talk about Scrum teams is that team members are dedicated. They're on one team. Yeah. So um, what's your experience with being on multiple teams. Like, can somebody be on more than one Scrum team and be successful? Sure. Well, okay, I was going to say sure and they can. <laughs> and um, be successful. The successful is where we start to have a problem. Um, you know, there may be rare exceptions. We have to allow for the fact that that could be true. But in general, um, blockages happen even inside teams, right? Because we're going to talk more about this idea of how people have multiple skills, but that doesn't mean that there aren't people inside the team that have critical skills. And so sometimes there's somebody we need for a certain thing and uh, gosh, they're off on that other project right now or something. And that causes uh, significant impacts when teams have to work around all that kind of stuff. So. Yeah, it becomes really difficult to make and keep promises. Like if, if you depend on Henry for something and I depend on you for something and we're all 50% on our team, yeah. it, it seems like we've got plenty of time to complete this thing. But if we don't know exactly which 50%, because you might get taken off for something else, you don't know when you're going to get that dependency from Henry. I don't know when I'm going to get the dependency from you, which leaves us all unable to make promises. Yeah. And, and really what you're doing on a scrum team every sprint is you're saying, we, we promise, like we're going to organize ourselves towards delivering this goal at the end of a couple of weeks. Yeah. And if you've got people who are available unpredictably, you basically can't plan a sprint. Yeah, it's sort of like we say, we do whatever it takes to get this increment out the door. And and, and we're going to mean that, but when you're part-time, you're sort of like, oh, I meant that, but sorry, guys, I got pulled off on important thing X or something and mm -hmm. causes significant disruptions to teams and to value production. Yeah, you can be well-intentioned and mean well. You've just set up a system that really fights against being able to deliver what you plan to deliver. Yeah. So dedicated team members, a uh, really good idea. And then that idea of, um, I'm going to use the word empowerment here, even though we misused that word a lot in the past, right? That if these teams are not allowed the space to figure out themselves how they're going to do stuff, um, if we're still sort of micromanaging them a little bit, even though we're trying not to, there's really it breaks something about the, the, the accountability model, the ownership, and, and things just don't tend to go well. Mm -hmm. And that can be a tricky thing for an organization transitioning mm -hmm. from another way of working to Scrum. Because you, you might tell a team that they're empowered, they get to self-organize now, 
but that manager who was in the details of the work last week is still there. It's still there. <laughs> still doing their annual review. Like yeah. still, We're asking them to change the way they do things, but frankly, it's tough. Habits, we're very habit-driven people. Like all of us are. And we have to retrain, we sort of say, everybody in the organization, right? Because mm. uh, if not, we'll create this wonderful little bubble here, and then somebody's going to come in and kind of, I don't know, prick the walls of that bubble eventually. And, and, right. and this is why this idea of, kind of training and getting everybody on the same page all the way up and down the organization ends up to be so critical to, to lasting transformations. Mm. Um, so uh, a question we got uh, was, does cross-functional mean everybody on our team needs to be able to do everything? Does everybody need to be a generalist? Uh, yeah, yeah, and perfect at everything they do, right? And, <laughs> yeah. No, right, we are not asking for super people here, though. You know, there's still an interesting correlation between high quality team members, right? So we don't want to say that's not important. Um, but what we do see, I think, in a really good team is that people kind of grow slowly their expertise areas as needed, almost kind of an on-demand thing that happens. And so teams will become more and more sort of able to handle anything that's thrown at them. And, and we can then let people work to their natural strengths, right? It's not like I have to go and become an ex, you know, website design or something, because I probably never will be but I can probably jump in there and help with something if it's needed. And if this thing keeps coming up, the team itself will figure out how to get it handled. Mm -hmm. And we leave that up to the team. And that's such a let it go thing for me, right? As opposed to when you were, you know, speaking as a recovering project manager, you know, we thought we had to go in there and make all those decisions and say, hey, Richard, you really need to pick up this thing. And we let the team decide. In fact, that's kind of our mantra in Agile, right? Let the team decide. Yeah, and you saw that in the video yeah. where, uh, should we do this? Ask oh, the team. Should team. we do that? Ask the team. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, so, so we don't want, or we don't require, I guess, the fully cross-functional individuals where yeah. everybody on the team could do every task. I, mean, I guess if you had that magical team, uh, you would be able to have everybody be busy all the time. Yeah, I mean, a simple way of thinking of that is if the team is getting blocked because there's an area where they still need outside help, we just want the team to over time say, you know, what would it take for us to, let's say we're inviting this outside expert in that we don't have something you know, that they can do yet. What if we ask them to come in now not to do it for me, but to do it and train us on mm -hmm. it? And we, over time, we get more and more self-capable inside the team. And that's kind of our goal. And it takes a while sometimes, depending on your environment, right? One thing I've noticed on a lot of the teams I work with is that everybody's got their specialty, like the thing on their business card. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I am a DBA. I am a front-end developer, whatever it is. Uh, but when you're in a pinch, when it comes down to it, you ask that front end developer and they're like, oh yeah, I've, I've done database work. Like maybe I'm not the database expert. But maybe they need to review my thing afterwards. That's their job. Yeah. So what we're really looking for on a healthy scrum team, what we see is what we call T-shaped people. Like you, you still got your specialty, but you've got breadth across a range of things and you can contribute. So when those database related tasks come up, the team can self-organize and they can say, oh, well, you know, Jane is our most experienced DBA. She should probably take this really thorny part of it. But this other part is the kind of thing any developer on our team can do. So why waste Jane's time on this? Maybe she'll review it for a while. Yeah. yeah. Get comfortable. Or team some people it. call these ideas. We might still have things you call a code guardian or a code shepherd that helps make sure we're, as we're learning, that we're not messing up too badly. Um, that feels a little scary to me. It is a little scary. Yeah, that seems like that could build hierarchy in a team really quickly. Yeah, it's... Uh, you know, the idea that we're, we're not, they're not blocking us, but they are going to come in and occasionally look at our stuff. I think that could be good. But. So let, let me tell you a story about that. Okay. Um, I, uh, early in my, uh, early in the, the history of Agile for All, I, I was, was coaching in an organization where they had a separate DBA team. And maybe we'll, we'll come back to this kind of skills outside the team question. And, and they recognized that had become a bottleneck for other teams and then, you know, what we're talking about here where teams could take a lot of the database work. Yeah. So they said, it's okay, we'll just have them do code reviews. Well, that same bottleneck that they had before is now the code review. Now it's a code review bottleneck. Yeah. And yeah. now they're calling things done that aren't really done weeks later, the DBAs review it. And now their identity, their value is tied up in reviews mm -hmm. rather than in 
creating code. So they are always going to find something to show that it was worth reviewing, mm. which meant that the work that was done in a sprint was never actually done. Yeah. It always cycled back. And they were actually in worse shape than when than they, were before. They, they knew they needed the TBAs yeah. to get something done. Now it's, they had the illusion of done. Yeah, but the idea that there's an external dependency there, um, as opposed to the idea that I see myself as, I don't know if the mentor might even be the right word in this mm, case, right? Coach. A coach even, that, that I will go I'm look at that. I'm building that capability into the team. Yeah, so. and I, my job is to come in and not tell you, wow, you sure screwed up again, but to come in and mm -hmm. say, hey, here's a suggestion for next time. And teams, again, just get more and more sort of cross capable over time. Yeah. Um, so to that question we get all the time, can I be on multiple scrum teams? So our, our short answer was no, get on one team. Um, but the situation I often run into, so I'll give you a specific example um, where people complain they couldn't be on one team. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a team at one of our longtime clients doing a new product uh, for their, their kind of current customers. And they were mostly focused on this new product, but at some point every sprint, um, this, their most experienced developer, um, Steve was his name, uh, not this Steve, but, but convenient. yeah, conveniently, um, somebody would come to Steve and say, Hey, this legacy app that you're the only one who can support <laughs> needs a change to it. And some of those were genuine emergencies. And some of them were just like the only way to get a change to that was to go pull Steve off his project. And they ended up with that situation where they couldn't keep their promises mm -hmm. on this team because he was always keeping track of this other work. So he had his own backlog over here. Mm -hmm. The team had their backlog. And so he wasn't officially on two teams, but he was effectively yeah. on two teams. And so what I suggested they try, and, and it worked for them, was to have one backlog for the team. And, and they and you know, bring that bring work urgent maintenance items in. to the team. Yeah. And they said, but only Steve's going to do it. And I said, I don't care. You're a self-organizing team. You can choose to organize that way and always have Steve do it. Yeah. Or maybe you discover that somebody else on your team could take certain ones of those tasks yeah. and maybe Steve doesn't have to be the or, bottleneck. Or being Steve, I'd say, you know, I'd like to be able to go on vacation occasionally. <laughs> right. So I'm pretty motivated to make sure Richard knows how to handle this a little bit while I'm gone. Yeah. So and, and even if Steve always chose to do it, visualizing it on the board showed the negative impact of that yes. work so that the team could self organize around his unavailability. This is similar to something that Jeff Sutherland blogged about a few years back about kind of almost like you back enough time for urgent maintenance items on a team. Now, there's some preferable things here, right? Like front ending with people rotating into maintenance and things. But sometimes you got one team, they got to do all this stuff. So you hold back a little time, you have some way to kind of make the interruptions visible. So we get to the end of the sprint and we're not happy with what happened. We say, oh, well, look what happened. You, you know, you pulled Steve off 100%. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so what, uh, what should a team do? It's another question we get. Um, what should a team do when a key skill on the team you know, can't be there full time? And so, like, maybe there are only three of these database experts. That's, I keep coming back to that because yeah, that's one of the common most common one. ones. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. we've got our three DBAs in, in the organization, and say we have six Scrum teams. Yeah. So no team is going to get a full time DBA, or if they do, it's going to hurt the other teams yeah. in some way. Uh, what do you recommend to them? Do you have any stories about what worked there? Yeah, I mean, I think what we, we, we do see people try the partial team member model, right? I'm sort of, you know, I'm 30% with this team or, or some fluid version of that. And, and again, it's awkward, but it sometimes can be the least worst solution. Mm -hmm. um, if they're truly being treated as an outside team, again, not our preference. Um, the idea of having kind of a a, a way of tracking things, which, you know, in the simple scrum case would probably be the scrum of scrums where you come in and you say, hey, you, you told me you were going to have X for me by sprint two. How are we looking on that? And you kind of keep in sync on these sort of things um, such that we are, we're being, we're still being agile, if you will, in the way that we're working with each other and we're bringing it up when we can't meet our commitments and things mm -hmm. and, and reacting quickly to that. Because re really agile in the end is a lot about reacting quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think ultimately it's the only thing that works sustainably over the long term is working on getting the skill into the team. Getting it fixed. Is, yeah, like the, the one situation where I see an outside skill can, as a service, working well 
is when that's a non-constrained skill. Like you have so much of that skill that you can get it right when you need it, Which and you almost, mostly don't. Almost need never it. happens, really. Because the reason they're not on the team is they were the critical reason, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the the common case I see across many of my clients where it works well is like a software team that doesn't need IT every sprint. You know, occasionally, they need a change to a development server or something like that. Yeah, and. They, they don't need to go full on to a DevOps model, and maybe we come back to DevOps right, yeah. later. That's a, a very loaded word. But yeah. if you occasionally need that thing and you have predictable availability from IT, and you can look at your backlog and you can say, okay, As long have, as I schedule them sometimes. Yeah, they, they've there, got a yeah. two-week turnaround, yeah. Yeah. and you know we need this thing in three weeks, so let's put it in their queue. Um, like yeah. That kind of situation can work, but if it's a skill that's required for every backlog item we get, or many backlog items we get, yeah. It's going to be painful. I mean, another one that I've seen, I think you and I were talking about different experiences with this, is um, tech writers, right? That mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we, we like to have tech writers embedded in teams, right? Because they, they see stuff as it's developing now. We get out of that old model of I read some requirement, tried to document it. It was all wrong. Now I beg you to review it. I mean, the whole model was broken. And now they're part of the team. But sometimes they're not 100% on that team, right? Sometimes maybe they're shared between two teams. And, of course, again, it has its its challenges, but sometimes the, the ratio of tech writers to team members is maybe not quite correct. So yeah, and and they're often kind of lagging behind the team. Yeah, and I I love it. Uh, you know, I, I'm big on behavior driven development, and I've seen some tech writers engage in BDD really well because they're good with language, so they're good at helping grow that ubiquitous language on the team mm. and getting them talking about things. So they almost end up like a tester. It's like mm. user guide driven development. Mm -hmm. How am I going to have to explain this to somebody? Yeah. Let's make it easy to explain from the beginning. But making it part of the process, again, is what's so cool here. Right. Because it was always this separate thing, and they'd come begging people to review their document, and we'd all be too busy. And it was a kind of just a whole negative side job. And now anything that is part of the deliverable is not a side job, right? It's our job. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, uh, Another question I get all the time, and, and you probably get too, is so a, an organization decides okay, we're going to try Scrum, and, and maybe they make this good faith effort of we're really going to do a cross-functional team. But then a few sprints later, um, usually a manager, often a test manager, mm -hmm. uh, comes to me with a question like, I'm having trouble keeping everybody busy all the time. Mm -hmm. Right. And that is, of course, the goal, right? Is the amount of what? time people's <laughs> the amount of time people's fingers are on keyboards is the right okay. measurement of productivity <laughs> in the old system, right? Yeah, you got um, me for a minute there. <laughs> um, but no, that was I didn't expect it. that to be the thing we disagreed about. <laughs> it was, but it, it was really funny because I had a personal experience with this one that was converting over into my first organization as um, we sort of went to them and said, just went to the of the leaders and we said, hey, leaders. You know, we're going to need to convert maybe one out of every five, ten people into Scrum Masters and product owners and stuff. And they said, oh, my gosh, you just lost 5% of the productivity of the team right here by taking those fingers away from keyboards. And, and it turns out that's all quite incorrect, but a right. very common viewpoint. Did that organization send developers to typing classes? Um, no, I don't want to. Because, I mean, yeah. if you're going to, if you pop <laughs> optimize for that, that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, they uh, should all be typing 140 words a minute. We are, which, you know, I used to, but not so much. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I don't think my development has ever been constrained by my typing speed. No, I don't think that's usually the constraint, um, which, you know, gets to other interesting things like what happens when you do pairing and stuff, right? Because you think it's inefficient, and it actually may or may not be. So. Yeah. So there's there's a conflict or, or tension between throughput, the value a team delivers, mm -hmm. and utilization, keeping everybody busy all the time. Yeah. If we had this perfect generalist team where everybody could do everything, and we're all fully and, engaged, and yeah. all the work that came through had the same demand for skills. Yeah, which uh, unfortunately which doesn't is unlikely. Um, this perfectly even supply and demand to a level that doesn't even happen in manufacturing. Um, if we had that, um, and yeah. we could perfectly balance utilization and yeah. throughput, of course, that would be extremely fragile to any disruption in anything. Yes. So what actually happens on a healthy team is there's one constraint skill at any given moment, and everybody else has slack in some way. 
And they can use that which to reminds me of a book. more T-shaped and yeah. maybe book Slack. Slack, yeah, yes. which just kind of talks about the benefits of this. Yes, yeah. Um, that you, you think 100% efficiency is actually your goal, and it really isn't. In fact, uh, yeah. maximal I, throughput. Yeah, I was a pretty efficiency-oriented guy back in my project manager days. And uh, my mother-in-law has a sign on the refrigerator that I think she put there for me that says it's pretty hard to be efficient without being obnoxious. So, <laughs> yeah, it's not really necessarily the goal. So what do you say to that manager who's trying to keep everybody busy all the time? Like, how do you help them? Yeah, I mean, I, I do think that there's some real things there that we can do, right, in the sense that we don't want somebody sitting around for days literally not feeling like they're adding value because that's not good for anybody. Mm. Um, but, you know, let's very few of the teams we work with, I mean, some of our teams, of course, are better than most, but many of the teams out there, they don't have the ultimate – testing environment with all the tools they would ever want and everything is 100% automated. So that, that theoretical QA guy um, very likely has something he could be doing, um, you know, in the meantime that, you know, like, let's go investigate a new tool. That kind of stuff should have been on our retrospective, you know, generated backlog too. And so there's almost always going to be some items there that we can deal with um, that may not be directly related to, oh, I can't work on this story right now. So. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see what other questions we've got here. How can we prove that a cross-functional team will outperform our skills-based teams? How can we prove? So my guess is this is coming from a scrum master in one of these big organizations who's getting pressured to maybe break prove up their team. Metrics. Yeah, show why this is worth yeah, doing. Yeah. Uh, it's hard, right? I mean, um, how'd you prove productivity before? Yeah, I guess <laughs> you probably didn't. Yeah, it's almost like saying, well, you know, you always kind of want to go back and ask the other question, which is so, so you're saying your old system really worked pretty well for you. So, okay, that's great. Maybe you shouldn't change it. But of course, that's not usually the situation. They say, well, no, it was really broken before. Um, and so one of the ways it's we fair to ask, like, how do we know this isn't more broken? Yeah. Or broken in any or way. Or maybe we run experiments, right? And that's all agile mindset stuff. So, mm -hmm. Um, so you might, for example, decide to convert a slice of an organization over for a while, run it for a while, just maybe you come up with objective ways, but maybe it's just subjectively, are they meeting their dates? Mm. Are they actually getting value out more quickly? Are customers starting to say, wow, you have something to show me after two weeks? That's pretty awesome. Um, and you're probably going to be able to figure out pretty quickly. And now it maybe becomes a little viral and we start adding additional slices. Mm. So, uh, I've now made it about 20 minutes without talking about vertical slices. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, right here I brought the word slice. You, you brought the word slice in. So, and it, it gets to this question for me. Um, so here we go. Um, it, anytime I've, I've seen this question come up, the new Scrum team has been organizing their work in a pretty similar way to the way they used to do it. So they've got this cross-functional team, but they're still doing very functional pieces of work, mm -hmm. you know, components and tasks, sometimes pretending to be user stories, like the, as a developer, I want to do I, this I, change I, to the database, yeah, which just kills me. Yeah. Um, but in that situation, a lot of times the, the first move isn't prove that this is better at doing the old way of working, but let's organize our work so that you actually do deliver increments of value because the old way probably delayed value pretty far yeah. and you showed progress by getting tasks and components done. So now let's say every two weeks we're actually going to deliver value. And, and when I say deliver value, I don't mean like we have the ability to log in now, but you can't do anything once you log in. I mean like really focus on I have the, an the core I have a middleware component ready to be. Interviewed. Yeah. That, that's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> I, I'm talking about like things your stakeholders and customers care about. Yep. Because what I find is that these questions of what's faster, what's more productive, are a symptom of I'm not seeing value. When you show your stakeholders overwhelming value, all these metric questions, all these productivity questions, all the how are you organizing your work questions go away. Yeah. It's like, I love this, give me more of this. And, and it's not like if you find yourself in a situation where somebody says, I need numbers to go make a case. There's some numbers out there, right? You can find some numbers, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah. Some good numbers, some maybe right. not so good numbers. But, I mean, there are some decent people that have looked at this and we're at least twice as likely to be successful, you know, <laughs> deemed successful. You know, and so there's some things like that. 500%? Well, yeah. Twice, twice the work right. in half time. Yeah. Um, 
so yeah, different metrics out there, but there are metrics. Yeah. Um, I see a lot of people measuring what can be measured rather than what and, matters. Yeah, what's easy to measure. It reminds me of the what, old, old joke of the, the drunk looking for his keys under the street light and someone comes over to help him and <laughs> asks, well, why, why, do you know where you dropped them? And well, I dropped them over there, but the light's, the light's over so here. much better here. I yeah. Can see. yeah. And, um, yeah, which could get us into a long topic about good and bad metrics, because uh, there is a favorite man to a metric. <laughs> so maybe that's a future yeah. <laughs> live stream. That would be a good one. Uh, <laughs> we, we've got a, a, a few more questions that have come in around um, cross-functional teams. So um, we have a cross-functional team. This one says, um, but we don't have testers. They're outside mm -hmm. our team. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. You keep using that word. <laughs> I do not think it means what you think yeah, it means. Yes, it's the formerly known as testers. Uh, well, no, the cross-functional team cross was the, the word yeah, that yeah, got yeah, me. Yeah, uh, cross-functional, but. But. Uh, yeah. So, okay, fair enough. Cro we've got a few skills. Yeah. We don't have all the skills. We're not yeah. fully cross-functional. I'm no longer an alcoholic, but I do like to have a drink every night. So, yeah. <laughs> we keep yeah. going back. Yeah. <laughs> It's the drinking thing, but yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah it is nine thirty yeah, yeah. in the morning. Um, you know, there's a story um, from the guys who do large scale scrum or less that I really enjoy. That uh, um, Craig Larman uses the term for the idea that we haven't figured out how to integrate test into the team. He says, "Well, you know, you may not be able to fully do that right off. You know, you need to, but you may not be able to do it. So, but we're going to rename them from the QA team to the undone work department mm. because we really need to understand that by deferring work that can't get done inside teams, you've effectively decided we can only live with some undone work and we have to do mm. N plus one testing models. And we really need to recognize that that is a serious short-term situation that we need to resolve over time. This is what leads to done, done, done. done. Yeah, done, 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 done. done. Yeah, which is ominous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you should yeah. stay away from that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but really, I mean, anything that defers you from having if the product owner said, I'd like to ship it tomorrow, guys, this looks awesome. Mm -hmm. And you say, oh, well, yeah, we said it was done, but it's not really tested yet. And maybe in six weeks we could ship it. You see the problem, right? Yeah. yeah. So I, I've had two really interesting case studies about this in the last few weeks. Uh, um, a couple companies I've been talking with. Um, one of them is a, a fairly agile company they've got largely cross-functional teams they're they're actually delivering things that they're, they're doing pretty well except they don't have enough qa experts to go around mm -hmm. and so they've got them part-time and mm -hmm. at the wrong times they don't feel like a team you know a variety the, the standard symptoms we see and in that case my advice to the rest of the team was do everything you can do to get your quality where you want it and make qa kind of a rubber stamp uh, make it basically easy on them to accept your stuff mm. as as done. Figure out how to build quality into your product. Um, so this is the agile team struggling to get QA in. Yeah. I, I had this crazy conversation uh, with a QA director at a big waterfall manufacturing company that's not even considering agile, but he's calling me about um, cucumber, some of these things. And he said, we, we treat our job as a QA department. Uh, for this software in this manufacturing company, like our job is to make it so nobody creates defects, mm. not to test and find them later. So yeah. they're getting in on specification yeah. and test first kind of stuff yeah. in in this cool. big waterfall thing. So it's and by like cucumber, by cucumber, expect. you weren't talking about salads here, right? So. No, no, I'm I'm talking about the behavior driven development tool. I didn't say BDD there because BDD implies small loops and a cross functional team, and they're not going there. Yeah. But they are doing specification by example, and they are automating some of those scenarios with Cucumber, and it's working really well. They're just doing it in these big two to six month batches, yeah. which I would ordinarily never recommend. Like I wouldn't be having this conversation with most companies because yeah. BDD comes after Scrum or Kanban mm -hmm. for us usually. But in this case, their, their perspective of what do we do as a, a QA team was so right on and better than a lot of our you know, more agile clients that I'm kind of excited about the possibility yeah. of um, sort of specification by example or big loop BDD, if you like, as the kind of gateway to agile. The gateway drug for agile. Yeah, I was trying not to say drug, but <laughs> yeah. um, because, you know, we're in Colorado. Uh, you know, there's a lot of good QA stories. This could be a good okay, topic gonna... sometimes because so... there's a lot of stories here about 
what do you do if you can't automate all your tests? And there's a lot of things we could talk about. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so let's take a, a couple more here. And, and if you're watching live, this is your chance to get your question in under the wire here so we address it. Um, but we got a couple more um, this week. Um, oh, one of my favorites. I wrote a long blog post about this, but we'll do the short version. Um, this person writes, our application is huge. A cross-functional team would have 30 plus people in it, um, mm. obviously bigger than the standard scrum team of yep. five to nine. Um, so what can we do? Yeah, I um, actually, one of my very first agile talks at a conference was about this because I came out of telecom and telecom has uh, an unusually high degree of specialization. Typically, I think in our team, depending on how you counted it, we have between 50 and 100 specializations. So you're saying, oh, OK, so even if everybody picks up, you know, three things, you know, now our team size is uh, 30 in our scrum team or and no, that's probably not a good option. So. One of the cool things, again, about self-organizing is that, you know, maybe at first you got these teams that have sort of, I got some stuff here, you got a partial overlap with me, there's another team over here. And so for a while, we're depending on each other, we're calling each other in, we're getting help. But it's always going to be this team, when you get that help, decide if you want to pick up a little bit of that skill. And so over time, and there's time involved here, they get a little more cross-functional, a little more cross-functional. And pretty soon, the things that we're hitting all the time, we have got in the team. There's lots of little weird things out here that occasionally come up and we may not have chosen to develop those skills. We'll still go ask for help. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got a, a short-term play and a long-term play here. And you basically have two conflicting goals or constraints on a Scrum team fully cross-functional, and able to deliver value, and nine or fewer developers. And nine um, is still pretty painful sometimes. Yeah, right? and so, uh, hopefully fewer. Yeah. So if those are in conflict, you have to decide which one are you going to give up in the short term and earn in the long term. Yeah. And most people choose to give up cross-functional and keep small, and there's, there's good arguments for it. It requires you to be really intentional about growing skills. Mm -hmm. um, what it often leads to is the sub-optimization of redefining what value is and saying our team delivers this we layer of components, components. Yeah. Uh, which doesn't put the force on you to get out of that. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's what I recommended for a long time. I've seen a few clients decide to adopt the other constraint and grow. Yeah, um, over so, the large team. so they started out with a large team and they said, this is going to be painful and we'll feel that pain every day, but we're going to be working together on value. And so that will force us to cross train to earn small to get to where we can split into two. And I often think about these big teams as it's not like they can't work. It's that you feel like you're walking through mud or something. Yeah. Everything takes too long. It's slow. The communication paths are too complicated. So, and, but really, if you're four teams that have to integrate in sequence to get something all the done, time, it's just as slow. You're just hitting it. Yeah. So the advice I give to scrum masters and internal coaches all the time is if you can't fix it directly, make it more visible, yeah. M make it hurt more, yeah. and, and not in a like, yeah. sadistic way. Um, <laughs> but in like, if that pain is there and you cover it up, it's still there. It's, it's still hurting you in some way. You're just not seeing it. Yeah. So I've, I've started moving towards the preference of the overly large scrum team. Mm -hmm. Because it just it keeps the pain and the opportunity to fix it right in front of you. And I, and I agree in the sense that I like to go for that fairly quick transition to get away from the component team thing, which can still be a comfortable semi-scrum way of working for a while, mm -hmm. but you really tend to get stuck there. And this is where Agile tends to get us into radical change, right? As we come in and we say, that idea of having a front-end team and a back-end team and a platform team, that may have to go away. Yeah. And that's pretty traumatic in a lot of organizations. Mm -hmm. um, but again, maybe you trial it by taking one person out of each of those teams, build your first cross-functional team, Try that one for a while, see how it works. Yeah, see what it looks like to really yeah. deliver value. Yeah. Vertical slices. Everybody's it's, happier. And that's the key it's habit. Not just the customers are happier. You know, the team is happier. I am actually feel meaningful work now. I don't mm. feel like I'm a cog in a giant machine, you know, where I can't really tell how I'm in, associated with value. Yeah. Um, all right, another one. How do functional managers uh, do evals for people on cross-functional teams. My favorite answer? <laughs> yeah, don't. Stop. Don't. Uh, it's fairly clear that at least the concept of annual merit review is toxic, and that's pretty well known. One uh, of my favorite books about this, highly recommended, um, Abolishing Performance Appraisals, mm -hmm. um, which 
you, you may need to be careful about having that out on your desk in certain organizations. Yes. It, it's actually less uh, harsh than it sounds. It, it divides up the, the multiple things we're trying to do with annual appraisals and yeah. says, here's a better way to do each of those. Exactly. I mean, it, it, it just real briefly on this topic, because I'm pretty animated on this one, is I was on both sides of that one, right? And, and annual merit review is not just miserable for the review E, it is similarly miserable for the reviewer. Yeah. And so it's a real pain, pain, kind of a no win scenario. Because what is the definition of good feedback, right? Timely being one of the key items. And so annually we come in and we talk about something is about the opposite of what any sort of a good feedback strategy would be like. And it was so bad that I used to have like managers in my organization that got sick at this time of year because it was just so stressful. So mm. it's a really negative thing and some really good news there, you know, like uh, over 10% of the uh, Fortune 500 have moved away from it in the last few years, and including I've even heard GE, which was sort of the poster child for bottom 5% kind of thinking. Oh, that's so, the worst. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but if if you're in this situation, you know, maybe you're the manager and you have to rate some number of your people as unsatisfactory or something, uh, it's time to look at your hiring process. Yeah, I mean, that's a hard one to change. No why do we as a company keep hiring people? Every year we expect that we're going to yeah. have let's, people that aren't good. Let's, let's get not do that. Who's, who's this year's losers? Um, and, and you can imagine that if you have to live in that kind of environment, there's probably some not entirely satisfactory compromises you try to make, like let's talk more about team rewards and less about individual mm -hmm. rewards. Let's try not to have, let's try to collect maybe team-based feedback, but don't have them feel like they're sort of narking on each other here or something. And so it's a really hard line to walk. Mm -hmm. All right, last one I see here. Um, why does Scrum call everyone a developer? <laughs> uh, well, first off, I wish it didn't, um, but uh, the spirit of it is, product developer it's together in whatever specialties we have we're working on developing this product this increment of value unfortunately developers is so embedded in our language as a shorthand for as a software coder. developer yeah. Yeah. yeah programmer um that i prefer to just talk about team members yeah you know because if i've got a tester or or on some of the teams i work with a mechanical engineer or something and I'm saying you're no longer a mechanical engineer you're a developer you know, Mm -hmm. What? Yeah. That's, that's not my role. Yeah, and the idea though that we're, it's really, the idea was good, right? You're trying to eliminate artificial boundaries and say we own things as teams now, not as individuals. And so mm -hmm. we don't say, you know, well, coders, we got all our stuff done. I don't know what's wrong with those <laughs> testing guys, you know, yeah. uh, you know just because we turned it over to them the last two hours of sprint, I don't know why they didn't get it done. That's all wrong, right, in a natural perspective. Yeah, so, so I would say use the words that make sense to you, but do what you need to do to create this identity of we work together as a team to deliver value. Yeah, we as teams feel this funny kind of a we are accountable together. And this, again, becomes an organizational barrier some places, right, about I need to know who is responsible here. And our answer is really clear. The team is responsible and accountable. And that's, yeah. that's again, another interesting cultural change. Yep. Um, parting words on Scrum teams. What do you think, Steve? On Scrum teams. Um, they are one of the hardest things to do right, and yet one of the biggest gain things, right, is if we can just get this working well enough to deliver actual value at the end of every sprint, true value, not partial value, that is itself perhaps the biggest accelerant um, for, a, for an organization. Yeah. So if, if this is something you're struggling with and you want to know more about, um, we'd love to talk with you and love to get your questions, talk about what's going on in your organization. This is something we have helped literally hundreds of teams do successfully over yeah. the last decade. And it's it's very doable in a really wide range of environments. Sometimes you just need an outside perspective. And, and this is where our passion lies, right? Because yeah. we really, when you see this actually work, and it's frustrating for us too sometimes, but when it actually works, it's it's an, it's incredible. Yeah, people really thrive yeah, in this kind of it's environment. It's amazing, yeah. All right. Well, thanks for joining us, those of you who are on live and for those of you who watch this later, uh, thanks for taking the time. I look forward to hearing from you with your thoughts and questions. Thank you all. See you next week.